Hello and welcome to the Chicago Kent Intellectual Property Law Program webinar. I'm Nicole Vilchase, Assistant Dean for Admissions, and I'll be the moderator for today's program. We're very pleased that you're able to join us. Our program today is intended to give you insight into the outstanding intellectual property law program at Chicago Kent. We'll begin with a panel discussion and then open the floor for your questions. Our panelists today are Professor Edward Lee, Professor of Law and Co-Director of the Program in Intellectual Property Law. Professor Lee teaches International Intellectual Property Law, Copyright Law, and Trademark Law. His research focuses on the ways in which the internet, technological development, and globalization challenge existing legal paradigms. He also writes extensively about the framers' understanding of the free press clause as a limit on using the copyright clause to restrict technologies. Sarah Anderson is a 3L with an interest in soft IP and data privacy law. In addition to her involvement with the Intellectual Property Law Society, Sarah is a research assistant for Professor Edward Lee and an active member of the Moot Court Honor Society and a soon to be published author of the article entitled When Insurance Companies Meet Their Match in Chicago Kent's Seventh Circuit Review Journal. And Alan Schrammick. Alan is a 3L from Oswego, Illinois and earned his BS in Electrical and Computer Engineering, his BA in Japanese Language and Culture, and his MS in Electrical Engineering from the University of Rochester in New York. At Chicago Kent, Alan is the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Intellectual Property and the Vice President of the Intellectual Property Law Society. After graduation, he'll be working as an Associate at Marshall, Gerstein, and Boren. Uh, thank you, uh, Nicole. Now, the first thing that I wanted to say is that our IP program is uh, fairly extensive. So in the half hour or so of this presentation, uh, we will not have opportunity to go over every single aspect, but I will recommend to you to take a look at uh, our website at kentlaw.iit.edu backslash IP, which uh, provides uh, a handy dandy directory to uh, look at all the different elements of our IP program. Now, in thinking about today's webinar, I try to identify what I think are some of the very special qualities of the program uh, for intellectual property at Chicago Kent. And I think we first have to begin with the IP curriculum. Uh, we have, I think, one of the strongest and most comprehensive IP offerings in the country. Uh, here, this gives you a snapshot of this year's course offerings in IP and related courses. Uh, so the first category of courses are doctrinal courses, meaning you study the substantive law, such as copyright law or patent law or trademark law. And we have 20 courses over the entire year that are these substantive law IP courses. We have four seminars, which typically involve writing a research paper on some issue of intellectual property. And then finally, we have a really good number of skills training courses where you learn hands-on uh, practical training from often from practicing lawyers. So for instance, we have an IP clinic that is run by the law firm of k &L Gates several of their attorneys supervise our students in real cases involving patents and trademarks. Uh, and this year we have a total of 34 courses, and that's, uh, I think, a fairly average number. It sometimes is higher uh, than that, uh, but 34, I think, is uh, a pretty typical year. We also have uh, a specialization in the study of intellectual property where it's kind of like majoring in a certain subject area in college. So in your three years of studies at Chicago Kent, you can obtain a certificate in IP by completing these requirements, which total 20 credits of intellectual property uh, work. Uh, now, as I mentioned, three years of studies of intellectual property one unique feature of studying intellectual property at Chicago Kent 
is that you actually can study in the first year of law school. And I think uh, there is no other law school in the country, or if, if there are, uh, it's you know, less than a handful that offer students this opportunity where you can take, for instance, patent law, which is the subject that is being taught currently. It's being taught to second and third year students, but it's also being taught to first years who are interested in studying patent law. And I imagine for those of you who are on the webinar who are science majors, uh, this might be the area of IP that you plan on specializing in. Uh, so your, your uh, first year set of courses would look different from the traditional schedule because you have one elective that you can choose, uh, including uh, every year there's a guarantee of one IP course that is an elective that first years can take. Now we have uh, one of our students here, Alan Shramick, who is both an IP certificate student who also took a first year course uh, in trademarks. And he will talk about his experience and why he pursued both the certificate and the uh, study of trademark in the first year. Uh, Alan? Certainly. Thank you, Professor. Um, I hope everyone can hear me all right. Uh, but so, yes, I did the, well, I'm finishing up the last, uh, the capstone class I need for our IP certificate. Um, and in my 1L year, I took trademarks during the second semester. Uh, I have a strong science background, so I was always kind of planning to go into the patent related path IP. Um, but during my first year, patents wasn't one of the options that we could take during the 1L year way program. Uh, it was some weird scheduling happened. And so trademarks was, uh, the the IP alternative there that I could take, but I really think that that was a fantastic decision because not only did I get a chance to get used to intellectual property, um, get it, get in, get kind of get my feet wet and get in, get an idea of how it all works, but it also actually has come into handy a couple times at my job so far. Even though I work primarily with patents, uh, during my interview for the for Marshall Gerson and Boren, where I worked original, where I worked for the last couple summers and will be working after graduation, uh, one of the partners that was interviewing me uh, runs her own trademark practice and was more heavily involved in trademarks. So I had a chance to kind of speak with her about what I had learned in the class and got an idea of what I was looking at. And actually, she was the one who called me back to offer me the position. Um, and I am still fairly certain that a big reason for that was because I was able to speak cognizantly and like have an idea as to what I was saying for an area of intellectual property that I was interested in, even though I wasn't really planning on practicing it. Uh, we spoke, that was right when, if anyone's familiar with uh, Inray Brunetti, um, now we Anku versus Brunetti, that was when that decision had just come down. And so I had an interesting chance to speak with someone who was a practitioner in the field and get an idea of what was going on there. So I think that it was really an invaluable experience that prepared me more than one would think, even though I'm not planning on doing trademark law. And as for the uh, certificate, I think it's kind of the same sort of thing where you get a chance to try all the different areas of IP, get an idea of what you're familiar with, and uh, get an idea for what works for you, what you might want to practice, as well as show that you have a commitment to IP and understanding how it all interconnects, because it really is, in the end, fairly interconnected. Okay, thank you so much, Alan. Uh, another special feature of the IP program at Chicago Ken is that we uh, offer an opportunity to first year law students uh, through uh, a selection process to become research assistants called 1L IP fellows who work uh, and do research for uh, our IP professors. And I have have had the pleasure of working with a number of outstanding uh, first year students who start working right away in the first semester. That is really a special feature that very few uh, law schools uh, offer. Uh, and we have here one of our uh, alums of that uh, 1L uh, IP fellowship, uh, Sarah Anderson, who will talk about her experience. Uh, Sarah does such a great job that I have continued to employ her as a research assistant after the first year. So 
Sarah, why don't you uh, tell us about your experience in the first year? Sure. Thanks, Professor Lee. Um, so I'm Sarah Anderson. And I was uh, Professor Lee's 1L IP fellow during my 1L year. Um, in order to be a 1L fellow, um, you just submitted your application along with a personal statement, essay about why you wanted to practice IP law. It's about one page in length, and it basically describes um, your background. So for me, having a BA in communications with an emphasis in graphic design and photography, um, I was coming to law school wanting to practice soft IP law, so copyrights and trademarks. And, and in my essay, I shared a little bit about my artistic background and what um, I thought would make me a great fit for the job, bringing a more unique and passionate uh, perspective to the program. Um, but the 1L Fellows Program really is designed to provide a select group of students with uh, unique opportunities to enhance their resumes and develop their own research uh, and writing skills during their first year of law school. Um, so as a 1L IP Fellow, you could work closely with uh, Professor Lee, who is on the webinar here today, Professor Greg Riley, Professor Dinwoody, and other IP faculty. Um, on various research projects that are related to copyright patent or trademark law. Um, usually work about 10 hours during the fall and spring semesters per week, um, and you get paid for it too, which is great. Um, some of the projects that I had the pleasure of working on during um, my 1L IP fellowship um, included some massive copyright cases where we compiled spreadsheets and wrote a lot of case summaries on some of the upcoming cases, um, as well as some trademark ones too. And obviously as a 1L, you'll be writing a lot of case summaries. Um, and so it's really good experience to get that practice in early um, and have you develop that. Uh, one of the big ones at the time that I had wrote for trademarks, I think, was a, a little bit of research on the Mattel versus Tam case, and I know Alan mentioned a little bit about In Ray Brunetti, um, but basically that was a huge landmark case um, about the disparagement clause in the Lanham Act, and so it's just a really kind of unique opportunity to be able to, in your 1L year, write and research about these relevant uh, IP cases that are coming down and get to participate a little bit in that. Um, so it was a great experience, and I recommend you guys all apply <laughs> um, to do that. Okay, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. Um, another uh, special feature of the IP program is that Chicago Kent is the Illinois Patent Hub, which is a program coordinated by the United States Patent Office to provide pro bono assistance from attorneys in private practice uh, to represent low-income inventors who would not otherwise be able to hire an attorney. So Chicago Ken is the patent hub for Illinois. And as a part of this process, we have an independent study uh, that operates uh, like a clinic in which students can do some initial prior art searches of the inventions of the applicants who are seeking pro bono assistance. Some inventions have already been made before, so would not qualify for a patent, and students help to identify at that initial threshold issue whether an invention is new, uh, help to identify if there's anything in the prior art. Uh, so this is another example of the sort of hands-on skills-based training that uh, students can get at Chicago Kent. And also, it's a very worthy cause to help low-income inventors. Uh, many of them are, are minorities, uh, some are women, uh, and you know, the bottom line is that it, they are low-income and would not have the resources to file a patent application. A another uh, unique feature of the curriculum is that Chicago Kent also offers a master's degree this is not a part of the law degree. Uh, this is a separate degree that is an interdisciplinary approach combining many of the strengths of Illinois Institute of Technology, the university of which the law school is a part. So members or faculty of the business school, computer science department, design school, and engineering department teach in this master's of IP management and markets 
Uh, and this master's program focuses more on the business side of managing an IP portfolio for businesses and covers such things as, as how to uh, conduct a valuation of the, of the value of the patent uh, or a patent portfolio. Uh, some of these courses, I think five of them, are offered also to JD students. Uh, and Alan, who you've heard from before, uh, took one of these courses, and he'll talk briefly about the course that he took. Certainly. Thank you, Professor. Um, so I, like the professor said, I took uh, management of IP portfolios with Professor Pyatt here at the law school. Uh, and it was a very different class from your standard law school class. It was a lot more expected to be actively engaged. One of the big things in the, well, beyond, beyond cold calling and the standard, here's the case law, it was a lot more, okay, how would you deal with this scenario in practice? Because this is the kind of scenario you may have to deal with in practice. One of the big things with the class was that we were given, we were allowed to choose a company at the beginning of the semester, and we followed that company throughout the entire semester. And so we would follow the ups and downs of them in the stock market. We would see what new uh, news releases they have and how uh, their IP has been changing. Are they currently involved in patent litigation? What about copyrights? Is there a piracy issue going on that they're dealing with? And kind of seeing how that affects things like the valuation of their IP, as well as just their general business strategy. And that was our, our final paper was acting as if we were the IP counsel or the chief IP officer or whatever equivalent position our company had, writing a letter to the board of directors and explaining, writing a memo of sorts to the board of directors to explain to them what steps that company should be taking going forward to maintain an active and successful IP strategy. So it was completely different from anything else I've done in the law school, but was a very good experience that I think is going to uh, give me a couple skills that I'll be able to use further down the line. Okay, thanks, Alan. Now, in addition to the IP curriculum, uh, Chicago Kent offers a plethora of other learning experiences as well as networking experiences. Uh, so IP conferences are a big part of the program, and uh, we are the sort of originator of a national conference that is called the Supreme Court IP Review, or Skipper for short. Uh, and we will be in our 11th year of hosting this national conference that brings in the leading Supreme Court advocates who argue the IP cases before the Supreme Court. Uh, this year, I believe there are eight uh, cases before the Supreme Court, although uh, now, given the pandemic, there is a delay in the oral arguments. Uh, but this is a big year for IP cases uh, before the Supreme Court. Uh, and here you see some of the keynote speakers uh, who were former Solicitor Generals uh, who represented the United States uh, before the Supreme Court in previous uh, years. Uh, in addition, uh, we recently uh, hosted uh, Director Yanku uh, of the United States Patent Office uh, at Chicago Kent, uh, who talked about some of his new initiatives as he undertook the role of being the director of the Patent Office. Uh, in addition, we also have uh, a number of centers that are devoted to various aspects of the study of IP. So we are the only uh, law school in the country that has a center devoted to the study of the intersection of design and the law. Uh, last year we hosted a series that was an interdisciplinary series bringing in professors, uh, a leading chef from Chicago, and a leading uh, world-known uh, designer who is based in Chicago to give us their thoughts about what is design. Uh, another center that we have is a center devoted to the empirical studies of IP, uh, which looks at, at using quantitative and qualitative methods, various aspects of intellectual property. And in the past, we have co-hosted conferences with the United States Patent Office, as well as the United States Copyright Office, looking at uh, various issues from an empirical lens. Now, uh, the final uh, sort of category of 
offerings of Chicago Kent uh, that we will turn to involve student activities. These activities are run by students. Uh, so these, uh, I may serve as faculty advisors to some of these organizations, but uh, students run the, the show, so to speak, for these uh, organizations. And we will talk about briefly uh, what these organizations do. Uh, the IP Law Society is one of the largest uh, extracurricular uh, organizations at Chicago Kent. Uh, one of the things they do is they also put on their own conferences. Uh, so this year in January, uh, they hosted with, uh, along with the IP Lawyers Association of Chicago, uh, I think the largest IP attorney organization in Chicago, uh, so it's a great networking opportunity. Uh, our student organization co-hosted this hot topic, or actually pot topic, uh, the new recreational weed uh, industry. Uh, yeah, our students are, are fairly uh, good at uh, and clever at coming up with catchy titles. Uh, I really quickly uh, learned. Uh, another important part of the IP Law Society is helping students develop their uh, employment skills and networking uh, opportunities. Uh, they put on several panels each year devoted to uh, resume and interview workshops, as well as having a formal mentoring program involving pairing students with our alums who are practicing in IP, as well as pairing our students with uh, upper level students, uh, 2Ls and 3Ls. Uh, and Sarah is a member of this organization and she'll describe briefly her experience uh, on the job networking and mentoring front. Yeah, so IPLS is just great. During your 1L year, um, you can ask to be paired with a mentor um, on IPLS. I know for me, one of my mentors was Kate Drass. She was really involved, had a lot of great advice um, about 1L year, how to incorporate, you know, interest um, and intellectual property into my studies going into the 2L year, you know, what kind of firms um, specialize in different sort of things. So having a mentor to kind of guide you through your, you know, following years in law school is really just an invaluable experience, plus the relationships that you make with other IPLS members um, can go past law school. Uh, the networking is always a good thing. They provide many events that you can have information that you're unsure or have questions that you can pose. Um, so really, it's just a great way to continue to have advice moving forward on how to pursue more intellectual property law classes. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Another uh, important extracurricular activity uh, for students interested in IP is our journal that is devoted to intellectual property. Uh, it's called the Journal of Intellectual Property. And a unique feature of this journal is that it actually has a partnership with a national organization called the PTAP Bar Association, which stands for the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, uh, a division within the patent office. So the PTAP Bar are patent attorneys who practice before the PTAP uh, within the patent office. And this is a national organization, and our journal is the official publication for the National PTAB Bar Association. Uh, and Alan uh, serves many roles, and he is the editor-in-chief of the journal. So he will talk briefly about uh, the journal. Certainly. Thank you, Professor Lee. Uh, as Professor Lee mentioned, we are, are the Journal of Intellectual Property here at Chicago Kent, and we publish both Gen uh, our general issue as well as our PTAB Bar Association edition every semester. Um, so we actually publish four editions every year to a semester. We work very closely with the PTAB Bar Association. Our connections over there, Chris and Josh, work very hard along with their members of their association to get us the uh, hottest topics and the best articles that they can find and send them over our way. 
and then we review them every semester with our uh, with our associate editors and then our executive editors to look over both our regular articles and these PTAB articles, which always range on some variety of uh, intellectual property. Last semester, for example, we had a professor's article from, I believe it was from the Max Planck Institute, on the development of German patent law over the years and how it's kind of evolved and changed and grown to meet how it works now in an international market and how Germany does things compared to how other countries do things. But we'll also have more PTAB uh, specific ones, such as, as is currently on the screen in front of you, we've got things about uh, sovereign immunity and how that actually plays at the PTAB, which was a huge issue last summer. Um, so it's always a really interesting range of topics. And associate editors are assigned to these different teams by, well, at the moment, myself and my staff, but next semester with our new eboard that we just recently elected. Um, though you'll be assigned to if you join these different articles and get a chance to kind of sink your teeth into it and learn more about IP. And this year we actually just started introducing 1Ls to our journal in a, uh, in a basic role, which had previously been limited only to 2Ls and 3Ls, to kind of give 1Ls a chance to get more involved in IP and to get a chance for how blue book editing and just general journal editing and uh, general functions going forward, which I know I wanted to do my 1L year, so we're really excited that we're able to offer this now to 1Ls as well. Okay, thanks, Alan. Uh, another uh, extracurricular activity uh, for our students, uh, actually you can get credit for this if you take it uh, as a part of a course, is being a member of one of our two moot court teams for IP uh, competitions. Uh, and we've had tremendous success over the years. Uh, you can see here our team won the national competition a couple of years ago for the tra national trademark uh, moot court, where you argue uh, a simulated case uh, based on uh, briefs that you write and submit to a problem that is uh, a national problem that all schools in the competition will be competing. Uh, on. Uh, finally, before we go to the questions, uh, as you might guess from all these offerings, uh, you know, our IP program has been nationally recognized, and I would say it also has been internationally recognized. We don't have a, a chance to talk too much about our international LLM program for uh, international IIP students. Uh, but that's another part of our studies where students from abroad can study IP here. Uh, these are some of the rankings that we've achieved from uh, different uh, sources. Uh, number, number one in the nation ranking by Law Street, uh, just recently A-plus rating by Pre-Law Magazine, and just recently U.S. News ranked us best in the Midwest, or number 13 overall in the nation. Uh, and I think that is a reflection of just the strength of what we offer at Chicago Ken in terms of our IP uh, courses and other activities and opportunities. Uh, here's my email address if you have questions uh, that you'd like answered, uh, if we don't have time today to get to your questions. Uh, but I think we do have at least 15 minutes for questions. Uh, so I think that uh, there, there will be a queue uh, controlled by Nicole, uh, who will uh, ask us, uh, who will share the questions with us. Yeah, so yeah, at this point we'd like to open it up for your questions. You can use the questions box in the webinar software um, to put in your questions. And we did have a couple that have come in already, so we'll go ahead and start with those. Uh, so the first question um, is, um, whether students can participate in both the IP certificate and trial advocacy, and are there any separate trial advocacy classes or opportunities available for students with an interest in IP? Yes, I think it is possible to do both the IP certificate and trial advocacy. Uh, the 20 credits required for the IP, IP certificate tends to be a relatively uh, you know, reasonable set of requirements enabling a student to take 
you know, a bunch of other uh, courses, inclu including the trial advocacy courses, or uh, students also focus on sort of courses for the bar exam. Uh, I know Sarah has done the moot court competition, which also takes a lot of time as well. Uh, so I don't know, if Sarah, if you wanted to add in about the flexibility of, you know, taking various IP courses and doing the moot court, for instance. Sure. Um, so I'm on part of the moot court honor society, which they have a brief writing and a competition you can do each semester, which although it takes a lot of time and it's really fun and it's great, um, I've still had plenty of time to take a lot of the IP classes that I'm interested in. Um, I haven't specifically pursued pursued the certificate per se, but I've taken a number of IP classes that I really enjoyed, and especially now in my th uh, 3L year, it's basically all electives and whatever I'm interested in, um, not even necessarily for the bar exam, but just that I know this is my last chance to take classes that I really enjoy. Um, so I think it should be fine to take trial advocacy if you're really interested in it, um, as well as the certificate classes. The, yeah, if I can, oh, oh sure. Sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say, uh, as as having done the certificate, honestly, a lot of the classes have kind of lined up purely by the by dint of the fact that I'm interested in IP classes, so I'm kind of taking them anyway. Um, it also helps that a lot of the classes you get credit for some other classes that aren't directly related to IP but are useful, such as administrative law, which was probably one of the most useful classes I've taken here. I still got a uh, half credit towards the IP certificate because of how useful it is towards intellectual property, which is another kind of mitigating factor there. Yeah, in addition, evidence would also count partially to uh, the IP certificate, and it would be helpful to the trial advocacy uh, as well. OK, so next question, Nicole. Yes, yeah, so next question is um, whether students who participate in the IP program primarily have STEM backgrounds. Uh, no, I mean, I think it's, it's a fairly uh, even uh, balance. Uh, certainly, we have a lot of students who come in with science degrees who know they want to specialize in patent law. Uh, but then we also have, I think, an equal number of students, uh, roughly speaking, who are more interested in copyright and trademark, as you know, Sarah herself mentioned. Uh, so you know, I think it's a it's a fairly even distribution uh, of students. Uh, I, I should just mention, if it's not clear by that answer, uh, there's no requirement to have a STEM background uh, to practice in copyright or trademark law uh, or even trade secret law. Where there is a requirement for a STEM uh, degree. Or sufficient number of credits in STEM courses, uh, science and engineering courses, uh, would be if you want to file applications for uh, patent applications before the patent office, you have to pass the patent bar, uh, which requires you to also have completed uh, a certain number of hours of credits in science courses. Uh, technically speaking, if you want to be a litigator, meaning file lawsuits or defend lawsuits involving patent claims, there's no per se requirement to have a science degree. Uh, some patent litigators do not. Um, many do, uh, but there I do know uh, some alums of our law school uh, who, who are patent litigators who have no such uh, STEM background. Okay, Our next Nicole? question is, yeah, next question is, do you have any advice on how to determine if IP law is the right focus area for you? I can uh, kind of help jump in here. Uh, I think that a big part of it is just going to end up being uh, taking a chance to take these classes and get an idea of what the law feels like. Uh, I know that's actually one reason why 1L Your Way is so helpful to other people I know who are kind of on the fence about IP. because especially a lot of people hear IP and they think patents, and so then they think science. And that's, that's a reasonable line of thought. But as Professor Lee just mentioned, it's not necessarily a requirement to have that science background to do IP in general, um, or even for some areas of patents. And so 
taking that chance to go, well, I'm just going to take a class on this 1L year, get some idea and go, is trademarks right for me? Is copyright for me? Or even is patents right for me? And get an idea as to how you feel about it. I think that's uh, definitely a useful uh, tool for figuring out how you want to or whether you want to pursue IP in the first place. Yeah, and if I could just jump in as well. Um, so I don't have a science background. I have a BA, and I was unsure actually my 1L year about whether I wanted to pursue intellectual property law or not. And the way that I became, you know, more confident in my decision to keep taking these IP classes is also through that mentorship program. I think knowing and connecting with other intellectual property um, pursuing degree students can kind of give you advice on what the classes look like um, and specifically you know if you have any content questions about that too I'm sure they'd be happy um, to tell you you know what the uh, what they've learned in the class and what that looks like for them in their job search and things like that so I think you know trying to get involved in the student organization at school attending the events um, I know during my 1L year, there were a number of events that kind of gave a brief snippet into what the world of trademark and copyright looks like in practice, and just being able to also talk to those attorneys and ask them questions was really helpful as well. Okay, and our next question is for Alan. When you took the um, trademarks class as a 1L, did you feel well prepared for the course, especially considering that your classmates were 2Ls and 3Ls? So that was definitely one of my biggest worries uh, going into that class was the fact that I had only been in class with 1L so far, um, but now was entering into a class with 2Ls and 3Ls who were a lot more, in my eyes, uh, prepared for this subject. And uh, in some ways, that was definitely true. They had more of this legal background. They had taken legislation and constitutional law, so they had some background for some of this stuff. But on the other hand, a lot of these concepts are still entirely new. This is new case law that they have to read and develop new concepts. Uh, you're not usually going to find something like fair use in criminal law, for example. Uh, uh, and I do say generally, just you know, to cover my uh, <laughs> to cover my bases here, because who knows? Uh, but it's it's a lot of new concepts, and as long as you're paying attention, you're doing the readings, uh, and you're making sure that you're actually following along and asking questions when you need to. Uh, kind of get a better understanding of it. It's it's not, uh, it's certainly not an unmanageable task, and I, I don't think it's too bad at all. But it's definitely a fear that I had going into. Well, I'll just add uh, the law school uh, took a look at this. Uh, we started the 1L uh, Your Way program as a pilot program and then uh, sort of uh, continued it. And in the first couple of years, we did a review, uh, and it turned out that first years in these IP courses did better as a class than the second and third years, uh, which I think uh, can be explained in part by the motivation level of first years being very, very high to start, start studying a subject that they were interested in. Um, all the other courses in first year are required and students have no choice. Uh, about taking them, whereas the 1L your way, you finally get a choice, and it hopefully correlates to something you're interested in, and uh, when you're interested in something and are enthusiastic about it, uh, that often translates to success. And the next question is about sort of the job opportunities available, and could you speak a little bit about opportunities available to those um, with the science background interested in patent law versus those without who are looking at the soft IP areas? Yes, I would say that uh, if you're considering job opportunities in Chicago, uh, which many of our students uh, do, uh, typically uh, there are more jobs in patents. Uh, that's how the market in uh, among law firms in Chicago uh, have developed. Uh, at the same time, uh, there are certainly also uh, job opportunities in uh, trademark, uh, maybe less so in copyright. Uh, and you know, sometimes people who are practicing in trademark uh, also practice in 
uh, sort of false advertising, uh, which is also which is under the same statute as the trademark uh, na uh, federal registration for trademark, uh, as well as uh, practicing in privacy law. Um, that's a uh, I think a somewhat typical combination of specialties uh, for people who do trademark. Some people focus entirely on trademarks, uh, and some people have a more I think diverse set of specialties. Uh, in their practice. Uh, so on the whole, you know, I think there are job opportunities uh, in IP generally. Uh, it, there are, in Chicago at least, uh, more opportunities uh, sort of on average, I think, for patents. I think we have time for one more question. So um, can you talk a bit more about the externship opportunities and um, how you identify those opportunities and then how students apply for the opportunities? Okay, great. So I, I would make clear uh, being an extern can be used in two different ways. Uh, one is as with a job or opportunity at a with a judge, uh, judicial externship. Um, or for our IP program, we have uh, two to three IP externships that are courses that, that you uh, apply for, like any other course, where you can, uh, if you are admitted, you can go work for a, a law firm that is in Chicago that specializes in IP. Uh, some specialize on, in patents, uh, and others specialize in uh, trademark or copyright. Uh, and so I take it like the question might be more interested in the kind of the, the formal IP externship program, but that is something that is offered every semester, where people, students can apply to it, and uh, if selected, uh, get credit for working on real cases with, you know, practicing attorneys. And I'm not sure if Alan or Sarah did the IP externship or not. Um, I don't believe so. Um, but that is an opportunity that is always available uh, every semester. Great. So we um, have reached the end of time for the webinar. We did have a few questions that we did not get to. So um, the admission staff will follow up with um, anyone whose questions we weren't able to answer today. Uh, we do really appreciate you joining us for the presentation. Um, if you do have other questions um, that you didn't get a chance to ask or that come up after the webinar, um, or if you'd like to re uh, reach any of the panelists on today's webinar, please reach out to the Office of Admissions by phone or email, and we're happy to um, answer those questions and get you in contact with anyone. Um, likewise, we can put you in touch with other faculty in the program, current students or alumni. So we really um, look forward to speaking with you further. We hope to see you at Chicago Kent this fall, and we hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much.